will become more and more aware of this. They're going to buy more and more of these appliances. They're going to boost them in the market. They're seeing an opportunity. Consumer demand as awareness starts to grow will grow with this. The second area is anticipating government regulation. Now, in Washington, this is tricky stuff. Climate change is very toxic right now. But take a look at what's going on at the state level, at the city levels, right here in Chicago, a lot of activity on this topic. Look at college campuses. The University of Michigan has just had a new policy that all new buildings will be LEED certified, silver. Other campuses, even more so. Uh, a lot of companies are doing this. There's a lot of drivers um, that are not happening in Washington. Um, and others are recognizing it. Um, and, and there's also international regulation going forward. What will motivate action in this country on climate change regulation at the federal level? It will be interesting to watch. There are a number of drivers. Protect the global climate. Get off foreign oil, as a metaphor. I actually have a, um, a, a 1952 Chevy pickup truck that has an AM radio with the, the vacuum tubes. And, and so uh, I've learned that AM radio is the, the haven for conservative talk shows. And I was li listening to one one time, and this, and this conservative talk show was good on said, you know, I don't believe in this climate, well, climate change stuff, but we've got to get off foreign oil. So we both have the same objective. Let's get down to it. I'm like, wow, there's a bridge that could actually get something happening here. Um, protect national security. Um, there's a group of army generals that has come out and said that climate change um, becomes a threat multiplier, that we could have instability around the world. There's an interesting book called The Pentagon's New Map, where the author draws a picture. And in the center is what he calls the disconnected world. Outside it is the connected world. In the disconnected world is 40% of the world's population and 2% of the economic activity. Now lay over that the amount of activity that the U.S. Army or military has around the world, and most of it lands in this disconnected space. He's trying to make the point that the lack of economic activity in this space is a main driver of our military activity, and climate change can make that worse and actually become more of an issue. Uh, enhance economic competitiveness. This is what Stephen Chu was talking about with the Sputnik moment. This is what Thomas Friedman's pounding on. We look at the investments in renewable energy, China and Germany with their industrial policy, major drivers here. Uh, GE, for the events, they had to develop their wind industry in Germany where there was a price for carbon rather than here, even though that most of the resources for developing wind are here. So they developed it there and then they're bringing the technology over. Um, a lot of people connecting it to their religious and moral values, a very interesting company. And then deal with the fiscal crisis. The new uh, proposals in Washington that I've seen just in the past couple of weeks are Carbon tax, okay, the trade, let's develop a carbon tax, and let's use that to drive down the debt. Let's see if that works as a bridge between the two sides of this. Could be a possibility, who knows? It's a, it's a very contested terrain, but this is the form of the debate. And then finally, enhance corporate reputation. If you do all this stuff, then you can uh, enhance your corporate reputation. Why would you do this? One of the number one reasons is the young people coming out of college today. Students coming out of college, want to have, want to work for a company that have, embodies the values they care about. Uh, BP, kind of fall for grace, but in 1997, the first major multinational said that climate change was real. One of the reasons they did this is because no one wanted to work in the oil industry. In fact, in 1995, 90%, excuse me, 90% of the American public agreed with the statement, the oil industry has no right to exist. It's very hard to recruit in an environment like that. Young people didn't want to work in the oil industry. And that move, that master stroke of starting to attend these issues, drove people to them. Jeffrey M. L. at GE says eco imagination. This does some amazing things with recruiting efforts. The CEO of Patagonia loves to boast for every opening. They have 1,500 applicants. They get to cherry pick the best, and they won't leave. Because when people leave, that costs you money. You have to recruit, you have to train, you're losing institutional knowledge. So if you can keep people, that's really effective. So that's one of the big drivers for improving their corporate reputation. Now, how to take action. I'm going to run through this really quickly. How are we doing on time? Okay, but I'm going to do this super fast. Uh, eight steps up here, eight step program, uh, three stages. Um, uh, I hate linear uh, stepwise programs. It's not that you have to do one, then the next, then the next. Um, I really find those problematic. Um, but just think about this as the different categories of issues that a company tries to think about when they think about climate change or reducing their carbon emissions. Number one, assess your emissions profile. This is not easy. Where do your emissions come from? You've got six greenhouse gases, 
Do you know how much your company is producing? You have to figure that out. You can measure direct emissions and you can measure indirect emissions. How much comes from your plants? How much comes from the energy you're buying from the power plant down the street? How much comes from people driving to work? How much comes from people flying to business meetings? You can measure direct or indirect. You can measure absolute emissions. This is how much CO2 we're producing. You can measure indexed emissions. This is how much CO2 per unit of GDP or unit of uh, revenue or unit of product. Um, internally, absolute measures work well. Communicating outwards, index measures really have to be it because you're actually, your index can go down, your absolute can go up if you're in a period of rapid growth, depending on what denominator you choose. Um, you can measure, develop, uh, measure your actual emissions or you can do um, uh, calculated emissions. This is how much fuel oil we use, you calculate and go from that. And then uh, a lot of companies, here's, a, here's a, um, an opportunity right now, there's a lot of companies out there looking for really good software solutions for measuring these emissions. Um, there aren't a lot of good ones out there. Companies are looking to spend a lot of money. If any of you good at these are IT folks, uh, this is a great opportunity. Now, once you know your emissions, you're not done. Then you have to figure out how much is this going to hurt and how much is this going to help and what's it going to do to our competitors. So you got to start benchmarking and figuring out this is our vulnerability, this is our competitor's vulnerability, what are we going to do about it? And you start usually focusing on risk management and bottom line protection. But then you want to look at opportunity space. Where are the places where we can actually improve the product line going forward? And so that's a theme throughout this. You start in the periphery, you bring it to the core. And um, next step is you develop actions to reduce it. Um, I had trouble thinking that and turn around. Um, but the first is you look for low hanging fruit. There are simple solutions out there on these things. And one of them is in green building. And I got this quote from someone from Swiss Re. Uh, his job, you know, Swiss Re is an insurance company, a reinsurance company, and they're mostly buildings. And so his job was to figure out how to reduce the emissions from their buildings. And he came to this conclusion, he said, we've never focused on this before. Uh, achieving a 30% reduction is simple. Do you light up your building like a Christmas tree at night? Do you turn your thermostats down? Do you have sensors in hallways or stairs where no one goes most of the day, and are they lit up or are they turning off? Um, there are so many opportunities in buildings uh, that, um, Companies that first start to look at this start to realize that it's actually quite, there's some quite easy opportunities in this space. From there, a lot of companies look for silver bullets, this single solution to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, you know, Shell found that a major source was, was flaring gas from their refineries. They start capturing that gas, uh, cleaning it, running it through boilers. Uh, uh, Jim Rogers at, at, at Duke Energy likes to say it's not silver bullets, it's a silver buckshot. And we're trying to hold, find a whole bunch of opportunities. Um, on system or off system opportunities is buying offsets. A little tricky territory. Uh, Al Gore got it right between the eyes, and the energy bills on his house came out, and it was some amazing energy high. He said, Don't worry, we're offsetting the emissions. I saw a great cartoon, and it um, seems appropriate here. There was someone on his knees saying, Forgive me, Father, for I have emitted CO2. And the priest says, uh, your, your, your sins are offset. And, uh, it's a little problematic, so you've got to be careful. But ultimately, you want to find ways to reduce greenhouse gases in a way that supports business um, strategy. You don't want to do this as an add-on. If you don't think of it some systemically, you're going to miss the opportunities. And the green building analogy works for me really well. You can go build a green, you know, I can take this building and I'm going to make it energy efficient. I'm going to put in super efficient windows and hyper insulate the walls. I'm not done if I don't recognize now I can downsize the boiler. Now I can start to do things and really take the advantage by looking at the building as a system, not as a bunch of parts that are clicked together. The same is true in a business. You have to think about it holistically. You have to think about all of it and how it all fits together and try and move that. Then you have to set goals and targets, and this is where it starts to get really challenging. How far do you push the company? If you want transformational change, you have to push them really hard. Because if you have an easy target to hit, people are going to hit it without thinking differently. And there's a wonderful line by Edwin Land saying the first step in having a new idea is to stop having an old idea. And the only way you get people to do that is push them outside their comfort zone. 